record. All right, so uh, welcome to this meeting of uh, quantum computing at Davis. It's, I guess it's another one of my workshops, although it's, it's more like a, a lecture, um, considering I keep fumbling with these code examples. Uh, but thank you all for coming uh, this Sunday. I think you've already been able to tell from the title that we're going to be talking about uh, QAOA, which is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. And we'll see why it's sort of you know, called that and uh, as well as go over how exactly it works. Although it's, it's probably gonna be more on a, on a higher level. So, that, so you'll see the math. I might not be able to get to the circuit. And then later on, Samarth will also have like a little snippet he'll present on the uh, caveats of this algorithm because uh, it's very tempting to think that QAOA and VQE are kind of these uh, magic bullets when it comes to being able to solve certain problems over the reality is there are certain uh, limitations to that. That being said, uh, if you have any questions at all, feel free to unmute yourself and, and stop me. Or if I'm going too fast, um, by all due means, let me know. Or if something seems iffy, you're, you're more than welcome to uh, sort of stop the process. And, and I'm monitoring chat as well. I have two monitors. So um, if there are any questions, I can definitely uh, see here. And I'm sure that if there's something that I miss, uh, I have my I have the rest of the uh, QCAD team to kind of bring up that question, should I, um, should it escape my vision? So that being said, um, let's go ahead and, and sort of get straight into the business of it. So I mentioned earlier that QAOA's official name is the Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm. Uh, there's a funny little thing on the uh, Grover documentation. So for those of you that don't know, Grover is the um, SDK um, made by Rigetti, which is another quantum computing company, and they insist that it's phonetically pronounced as Quawa, which I've never heard used ever in my life um, as a, a quantum computing sort of software dev. Not to mention that this comes from the team that unironically uses Lisp for quantum computing. I don't know about you, but I've, <laughs> I'm just I'm just throwing some some friendly punches here. Rigetti, please don't preclude me from from any hiring opportunities. Uh, I digress. Uh, the idea behind uh, the QAOA, I, uh, I want to point out here, I want to really pay attention to this kind of, oh, this idea here, uh, approximate, approximate, in, in quotation marks, approximate optimization. Okay, uh, we have a guest here that says, I totally say, well, well okay, then I, I'm most likely on the uh, wrong end, though, although I think I've, I've always heard people spell it out as, QAOA. Um, and I think it's only in the Grover documentation that I've seen Quawa explicitly written out that way. Um, so it could just be me. Um, <laughs> so this, this idea behind approximate uh, optimization, oh, let's summon in the waiting room, is that we can define the quality of our solution. So if you guys remember, I think a, a couple weeks ago, I gave an example on uh, adiabatic quantum computation and the fact that. Uh, there's some trade-off in terms of the time you invest in solving that problem versus the quality of your solution. So this, this approximate is, is because there's a parameter that you feed QAOA. Um, it's, it's known as P in the official research paper by uh, Farhi and Goldstone. Um, I'll try and link that in the official recording or, or the description. Uh, and usually P is defined to be greater than or equal to one. But as you increase P, the uh, quality of the solution to your particular problem gets better and better. And I'm, I'm not going to explain what exactly P is just yet. But I do want to keep that in mind that it's, it's approximate. So, so some of the solutions you'll get are not guaranteed to be like the, the best um, solution ever. Or uh, I guess in fancier terms, the global maxima or global minima of the problem you're analyzing. So that being said, uh, I wanted to kind of point out the official, this, is, this comes straight from the Grover documentation as well. It is a polynomial time algorithm to find a good solution to an optimization problem. And that's what I, this approximate gets tied heavily in with good because you get to define um, how good is good depending on the resources you have in your quantum computer um, and, uh, Oh yeah, Samarth has been uh, nice enough to link the original paper, um, the archive link. You can go ahead and it's it's a very readable paper too. Um, that's that's really nice to uh, have. Uh, and uh, apparently, you know, apparently there's also some paper that says that QAOA might be able to exhibit quantum supremacy, which is the idea that um, its performances can far outclass anything that could be classically done. Although I think that's that's yet to be shown. I haven't heard of a, a QAOA supremacy example, although we have already seen um, this kind of contested battlefield over. Uh, Gaussian boson sampling, which is another 
inherent problem that seems to exhibit uh, properties of uh, quantum supremacy. That being said, uh, I'm, I'm still taking this from the documentation just because it's such a, a nice example here. And it says for a given NP hard problem, uh, the, approximate, the approximation algorithm is, polynomial, is a pro polynomial time algorithm that solves every instance with some guaranteed quality and expectations. So, there, so there's kind of that iffiness around quality, right? Um, but I wanted to kind of just you know, briefly define, uh, because NP and P, like usually uh, I think uh, kids get, the kids get docs and a lot of tutorials will intentionally omit um, a lot of the uh, uh, grittier computer science terminology. Although the real idea behind NP hard, and I'm taking this from Wolfram Math World, is that it's at least, uh, a problem is at least as uh, you know, hard as NP, or it could be, it could be harder than NP, um, or at least NP or harder, but or I should say more computationally intensive to process in a sense. Uh, but NP, for those that don't know, means that given a problem, I can solve it in polynomial time if I use a, a non-deterministic Turing machine. So the Turing machine is kind of the, uh, so I, I should say it's uh, let's see, solvable in polynomial time, uh, let's see, using a uh, non-deterministic Turing machine. Um, there's actually a textbook link uh, that I, I keep saying I've been working on it. The reality is that I've kind of shelved it for a while. Um, but it's, it, it is kind of like a compiled resource that our organization has. And I do explain kind of this idea behind like NP and the sort of polynomial hierarchy that's in the official announcement email. I think it might be on the LinkedIn uh, announcement as well. But uh, if you don't, if, you st if this still doesn't make too much sense, I wouldn't worry about it. Just, just keep in mind that QAOA is meant to have uh, some very promising uh, uh, performance speed up, which is what we can classically do when solving particular problems. Now, QAOA, even though like it says, okay, it's an, it, it can target NP hard problems, which is true. There's one particular class of problem that you always see associated with um, QAOA. And I mean, I know I could save time by saying Quawa, but that, that doesn't quite roll off my tongue as, uh, as nicely as <laughs> QAOA. Um, and it's designed to solve uh, what are called combinatorial optimization problems. So I'm gonna go ahead and give the um, formal definition of what a combinatorial optimization problem is. And this is straight from the uh, Farhi and Goldstone um, paper here, where we have um, something that looks like this, alpha equals one, let's see alpha, and then Z. So we're trying to solve, in essence, uh, this kind of uh, optimization problem where Z is some kind of bit string, right? So Z is defined as Z sub one, Z sub two, Z sub three to any n number of bits. So this can either be like, you know, one, zero, zero, or zero, one, one. Uh, it doesn't really, you know, you get to, the, the number of bits are dependent on the problem at hand. This alpha here, or sort of M, M is the number of clauses. So what we mean by a clause is like some kind of constraint on the problem. So if, if this bit string represents some configuration of a system, um, you know, for, uh, for like knapsack, for example, knapsack is the idea that I, I have some kind of, uh, I, I'm, I'm combating several constraints here, but one of them is I, I have like a limited, uh, literally a, a knapsack or backpack in a sense. And I have all these different packages with different sizes and different value to them. So like maybe a, a really small box uh, might be $5. But a, you know, a bigger one might be $10. And I have like a, a, this entire arrangement of, of boxes and I'm trying to fit them into this knapsack to get the most value out of it. Um, so I, I would sort of have two clauses in a sense there. Um, one of them being that, uh, okay, all the packages need to like fit in here, but I wanna maximize the uh, value as well in a sense. So if, if uh, those are constraints, not, not clauses, sorry. But the, the idea behind each of these clauses is, is sort of the restriction on your problem. And every time this uh, C alpha gets, you know, so C alpha is the clause. If C alpha is satisfied, so we have met the clause and it's equal to one. So your idea is with multiple clauses, you wanna get as many ones as possible. So when you sum it all together, you get like some large integer and the larger, the better. So that's the idea behind a, a combinatorial optimization problem. The, Optimization makes sense. You know, we want to get as many ones as possible. The optimization, or, or the, the sorry, the combinatorial component comes from the bit string itself, because the bit string is defined on discrete objects or things. It's not, it's not a continuous problem, right? So if I if I have uh, something like a, you know just an arbitrary function here, and I, I'm just trying to find um, the local uh, the global minima here, 
then what I'm left with is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of infinitely varying. I can take like any infinite point on here, right? So, you know, X could be uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 or 0 0.0001. Uh, so that's, that's not what we would consider a, a combinatorial optimization problem. But uh, with knapsack, you remember I said like we have a finite uh, or you have just these discrete, you have these discrete boxes uh, with discrete uh, or with associated values to them. So you get to pick these uh, individual uh, objects in a sense. So this, that's what a, a combinatorial optimization problem looks like. Uh, and I wanted to give sort of two motivating examples. Uh, these examples might sound very familiar. I'm just revisiting them from the last workshop, which was the, uh, which I talked about sort of adiabatic systems of computation or AQC, adiabatic quantum computation, which is used by a D wave and, and the whole idea behind quantum annealing. Uh, but I'm, I'm revisiting them here just to kind of put them in the context or provide a motivating example of why we should care about, um, you know, Quawa and uh, all that stuff. But, uh, oh, and, and by the way, if you try and dig up that video and it's not up, don't, work, don't fret if you can't find it. That's, that's totally on me. It's because uh, I have to go in and edit that video and, and make sure I finish adding all the uh, sources that I've used in it. But one of the uh, common ones that you'll always see and which literally every example of QAOA seems to cite is max cut. So what is the idea behind max cut? Well, I kind of like this definition from, uh, th this, from another paper, and this paper was not meant for QAOA, but the way it defines max cut is essentially equivalent to everything else I've ever seen and everything else you'll see too, which is that given an undirected graph, uh, or you know, usually the notation is G of V comma E with a vertex at V, and an edge set E, the max cut problem seeks to partition V into two sets such that the number of edges between two sets considered to be severed by the cut is as large as possible. So I'm not, uh, well, let me sort of write it down real quick. So suddenly we have a, a graph that's usually defined as, uh, you know, so you have a, a set of vertices and a set of edges. Um, what happens is with max cut, let's say I have this triangle, I want to find a way to divide this graph or to cut it up, literally cut it up in such a way that the largest number of edges is, is cut in half. So this would be kind of an optimal solution here because I've, I've cut two edges and, or, or um, equivalently, you can do something else. And this is a very trivial example, but uh, usually you'll encounter even larger examples where you might have tens or hundreds or thousands of these vertices with different edges. And then it doesn't become so trivial to uh, figure out the cut in which case then it will need some kind of algorithm to do it for us. And usually with a max cut, uh, in this example, I don't show uh, these edges all kind of quote unquote weigh the same or they have the same importance, but um, usually what happens is they'll have a weight associated to them. So there's like another uh, thing is, okay, you want to cut the edges that have the most weight. Uh, and then uh, in which case you've partitioned your vertices into two sets. So that, you know, this, this would be long and maybe set A and these vertices would belong in set B. In fact, with the bit string representation, remember, like, why is it, you know, why is it a bit string? Well, this makes a really nice example because I can say that if a, a set is in the cut, or if a vertex has made the cut, I can, or an edge, right? If an edge is in the cut, I can say, it, I can say it's one, but if an edge didn't make the cut, I say it's a zero, or uh, usually it's not the edge, but it's, it's the vertex. So this, so this vertex is in A, but this vertex is uh, not in A, and this could be vertex one, vertex two, vertex three, vertex four. So that bit string is a very nice representation uh, of which vertices are in or are not in the, uh, that have literally, quite literally made the cut. And we don't need, you know, we don't need another digit. We can literally say it's in or not in because by saying it's not in, we know it's in the other set or other part of the cut. So that's, that's max cut. That is a classic combinatorial optimization problem. Um, and I think I, I think I even use this as my motivating example uh, for the sort of adiabatic quantum computation. And in fact, uh, I don't mention it in this workshop, but if you do have a chance, uh, you can check out Michael uh, Stetchley. Uh, he wrote uh, a num uh, two wonderful blog posts, and very detailed. In fact, the good chunk of my work here is based off his post, but I've added in some extra details I think will help you guys understand these algorithms better. But he does a great job of explaining uh, max cut and, uh, or max cut in the context of, these algorithms and uh, its relationship or the, re the relationship of uh, QAOA to AQC, because they are 
uh, if you look at them, they do have a number of similarities. Uh, adiabatic quantum computation, where we are literally uh, adiabatically changing a Hamiltonian to find its, um, oh, there's someone in the waiting room, sorry. Uh, we're adiabatically changing the Hamiltonian to find the solution versus QAOA, which you know we're not performing an adiabatic process in, in QAOA, but its methodology or, or it is very similar in a sense to how AQC would work um, in that you have kind of two Hamiltonians um, that are, are being applied in some sense and you're, you're making some kind of transition between the two Hamiltonians, which will eventually get to your lowest uh, level uh, eigenstate. So there's some, kind of, there's some kind of two Hamiltonians. And this notation, by the way, is, is not official. This is just me saying that there are two Hamiltonians involved. And by applying them or, or performing some manipulation on them strategically, you'll get to your lowest level, uh, your lowest level uh, energy eigenstate or eigenvalue, which is what we want if you've encoded your problem correctly uh, in the Hamiltonian. So that, that's kind of just an aside to keep in mind. So max cut is, is one CO problem, combinatorial optimization problem. The other one is the traveling uh, salesman's uh, uh, TSP, uh, the traveling salesman problem. And uh, let me just get my uh, notes in order here. So there is one definition that I like. Uh, it comes from Catherine C. Uh, McGeoch. Um, there's a, a book that I think she wrote or it helped compile together a bunch of different uh, demos from, and it's just called, it's, the book's literally called Adiabatic Quantum Computation and Quantum Annealing in Theory and Practice. I'll, once again, don't worry about uh, uh, getting links to these sources. They will be on the official video that I will go ahead and, and publish. Uh, once this is done and I've been able to edit everything. But the idea behind the traveling salesman problem is uh, given uh, the motivating example is that you're in maybe some kind of fictional country with a number of cities. And I, I start in one city and I want to find uh, some kind of optimal path where I visit each of the cities at least once as a salesman. And then I return to my original starting point. And in, in graph theory, um, usually we call this a Hamiltonian uh, a cycle in that you, you start in some point and then you, you visit each node in the graph at least once and then you'll get there. But usually if there's like, you know, multiple pathways you can choose, uh, then it becomes very much an optimization problem. And it's uh, combinatorial too, because we have a discrete set of edges. I'm not tuning some infinitely continuous function here. It, it's literally picking these kinds of, uh, uh, picking these edges in the traveling salesman's problem. And you want to ideally, reduce the amount of traveling or the distance you have to do. Sometimes these can be weighted edges too. Uh, usually, you know, they're undirected, so there's no specific direction to them, but um, they'll have some kind of uh, weight to them. So you know, 10 means like, oh, this could be 10 miles, or this is a, a path I don't want you to take, but this is very short between the two cities. And uh, QAOA is able uh, to handle PSP as well, uh, literally any uh, CO problem. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and omit the, uh, the I, I just kind of gave, this is literally from, Wikipedia definition, but for the official definition, you can look up uh, Catherine's, or sorry, Dr. or Professor McGeoch's example, or there's one from Georgia Tech from Mark uh, Goetschalks, but he gives a, uh, it, it's sort of an identical definition, and he cites another source, uh, Golden et al. Uh, from 1980. I'm not sure if that's a textbook or another paper, but um, that's for a way more formal definition. This is TSP. But in, in both of these problems, what I want you to, to really drive home, you know, really take home with you, is that you know, you, we have a, a discrete set of objects, and there are a number of constraints we are imposing on those objects. Uh, and, and QAOA provides a uh, very efficient method of figuring out the selection of those objects for that particular problem. So in both of these cases, the object in question has been the edges. Um, that uh, you know, edges for the path or edges uh, in this case for max cut, or, but they don't have to be edges. Um, they can be items. Uh, I gave the example here with a uh, knapsack where I literally have a backpack and, and you differently valued objects. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, if I can, um, you know, how, what objects can I choose to fit in my backpack in such a way that I get the most value out of it. So those are kind of the uh, motivating examples. Now, with that being said, we can, you know, ideally, I'd love to just jump straight into QAOA. I, I, you know, give you the definition and how the algorithm works. But uh, QAOA is very intimately related um, to VQE. In fact, I'm, I'm quoting from uh, Michael here in that VQ, uh, QAOA is literally a specialized instance um, of VQE. So in that case, it's probably very much worth uh, visiting uh, VQE's uh, modus or principle of operation. And then you'll see that it's, it's pretty much uh, very similar 
to uh, uh, what QAOA does, or QAOA is a, a restricted subset of what VQE can do. Before I go any further, I know I've been kind of blabbering on about these uh, very fun little problems and combinatorial optimization and all these Hamiltonians, but uh, are there any, any questions so far? Feel free to put them in chat or uh, unmute yourself and I can, I can hear you out. Okay, cool. Looks like everyone's still. Hello. Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, oh yeah. Just I came from. A, uh, I just wanted to share a thing. I am. I just came from IBM Quantum Challenge, and on there I am working on BQE actually. Yeah. Oh wow! Wonderful. Yes, the. Uh, uh, I hear the Quantum Challenge is going. I wish I could have participated, but I'm. Um, I'm pulled six ways from Sunday with all the stuff that's going on. But no, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, VQE. Uh, VQE and QAOA are part of a family of even larger algorithms, which are called the variational um, algorithms. Uh, and the idea is usually you're tuning some kind of uh, uh, quantum state. And the way you tune it and, and measure the result will give you a solution to a particular problem. Uh, that's also from Michael's blog, by the way. And uh, Michael works for uh, Zapata, uh, so, so it's a pretty reputable source. I know if I, if I bring a blog, um, then some issues come up. But I don't think there are any more questions. So I'll go ahead and, and sort of jump into uh, VQE. And, uh, and this is just very brief, by the way, because I, I covered VQE in a prior workshop. I, I, I have yet to redo the video for that because uh, I think I found there was like an error in my presentation. So this'll, this might be my redeeming point here. So the, the idea behind VQE though, is we have to uh, consider the variational principle. Um, it, it's called principle. I've seen it written as method before. It's the same thing. Um, the variational principle. This, is, this comes from quantum mechanics. So uh, before VQE even existed, this was already uh, a, a principle that existed in quantum mechanics. Um, and, but the variational principle requires us to understand um, what expectation is, so what the expectation value is in, in quantum mechanics. Um, expectation is, uh, before it was a thing in quantum mechanics, <laughs> it was a thing in statistics. So you kind of see there's this uh, interesting little uh, uh, trail that goes on. And the idea behind an expectation value is a, it's a weighted average of all your results for a certain um, thing you're measuring. Uh, the example I always like to give is, let's imagine I have kind of a, a six-sided die, right? And I think there's an example on mathworks.com that also has the same thing. Um, but uh, that you, you, I just mentioned it because you know, if you want to see a, a maybe a beefier example, it's definitely there for you. And the idea behind the expectation is, uh, so we know the results of a die can either be anywhere from one to six, you know, one to six. And each side, given a, a, a fairly weighted die, so, so you know, if you're, uh, as long as you, someone didn't give you like a really bad pair of die, is a uh, one out of one over uh, one over six because each each result you can get from one two three four five six has a probability of one over six of showing up. So in order to get the expectation value of that die, um, so I just usually the notation is like e and then square brackets of uh, your random variable, which in this case is my die. So I just do one over six times one plus uh, one over six times two plus all the way to uh, one over six plus six. And I want you to notice something, and this is something that I want to, to really drive home because this is a, a common mistake people make with expectation values. The answer comes out to 3.5. On a normal dice, there is no way you are going to roll a 3.5. That doesn't exist in this set of states. But this is over, like, you know, if I rolled the die many, many times over, um, then, and I, I calculate the weighted average in this sense, you will get 3.5. So 3.5 is, um, uh, there's a, a source here from the Australian National University. Um, and I, 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 this is, I'm quoting from them, is that expectation value is not necessarily the value one would expect to obtain if an observable is measured. And the expectation is equal to the average, not the most likely score. Even though I, I mentioned it's a weighted average, so you would think, oh, if it's weighted, that means that the, the, the larger value with the larger probability is the thing that'll come to the top. Although the reality is a summation, right? So, so you, you come up with these values that don't correspond at all. And, and when I say observable, you can say that's one and the same with an operator, although there's a, there's a bit of a distinction there, uh, but I'm, I'm purposely being a little uh, loose in my uh, terminology just to, in, in the purposes of saving time and, and keeping things simple here. So what do I mean is if I have some kind of uh, uh, quantum observable, uh, 
usually some kind of operator. I'll, I'll just make up an operator like uh, A, right? So A, um, and I apply it to some quantum state. And then there's some kind of eigenvalue associated with like, uh, I, I don't know, two, for example. Uh, this is sort of the uh, observable, like there's some kind of associated value or eigenvalue uh, with that operator. But if I were to take the uh, expectation of A, you would find that I might get a value that is not in line with any of the eigenvalues. It, it is not a valid eigenvalue. And that's the whole point of the expectation is that uh, in, in the quantum realm, and I'm taking this from J.D. Kresser, the idea of the expectation of a, a quantum observable is that I can either have a, a quantum system, so I'll, I'll just make the circle my quantum system, and I have identical copies, uh, many, 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 many identical copies, and I perform um, I perform an observation or a, a measurement on, or I apply, I apply the operator and I get the result of applying that operator. So, you know, maybe the uh, associated eigenvalue or something like that. And then I do that summation, then I will get the expectation value. So it really is a, an average. So you either have to have uh, many systems that are all set up the same way, and then you perform that measurement, or you can repeatedly, you know, set up one system, do it again, set up one system, do the measurement, set up one system, do the measurement. But the, 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 the main idea is that you need to have uh, many, many multiple measurements, and then you'll, you're able to figure out what this expectation is. And usually it's some combination of the uh, eigenvalues, uh, the weighted probability of your eigenvalues uh, over time. So that's, that's what the expectation value is uh, in, in the context of a, a quantum operator. Um, so, so you see that this is the classical definition from statistics, and it goes into quantum mechanics. Uh, and then from quantum mechanics, we can go into the variational principle, which is uh, what I really wanted to get into for VQE. Does, does this make sense so far? Um, I'm just checking in with you guys to make sure I haven't lost anyone here. Uh, is, what I'm trying to get home though is that the expectation value is this kind of weighted average and uh, it doesn't have to correspond. It's not the, you know, going back to that quotation I got from the Australian National University, it is not the uh, most, most likely value, right? It's not the most likely value. It's just the, uh, if I take repeated measurements and then I take the average of those measurements, uh, that's what I will, that's what I'll get as the expectation value. Okay, if there are no questions so far, I'm gonna keep going. And if I'm going too fast, you know, by all due means, please stop me. So with, with the uh, understanding of this expectation value in mind, now we can actually get to the uh, variational principle. And, I think in the original VQE video that I did, there is a very formal way of deriving why it is that this is true, but you're more than welcome to uh, uh, derive it for yourself. It's actually not a, a, a terribly difficult derivation, although it does require you to really understand your quantum mechanics well. But the idea behind the variational principle is this. Let's imagine that I have some Hamiltonian, so it represents the sort of energy uh, of my system, and I have some quantum state. And the Hamiltonian, you know, ideally we want to find this kind of lowest a level energy uh, eigenstate, the eigenstate and the associated eigenvalue. Uh, and, and this is a pretty a computationally difficult thing to do. Um, that's sort of why VQE even exists in the first place. We want to find this and this. So you need the eigenstate and the eigenvalue. Um, and it's, it's, not, you know, it's not always clear or computationally efficient to formulaically figure this out. So we, we usually end up doing, what we can do is we can do this. So if I take the bra, and then you know, here's the Hamiltonian, and then I take psi here. Uh, this gives me the expectation uh, of the uh, Hamiltonian operator. So the way to think about this is if I measured the energy of this particular state many, many times over, and then I took the average of that, then that would give me, um, that would give me the expectation value. And there, you know, within the proof, there's actually something that states uh, the following. Uh, let's see here if I have it. Down. Okay, yeah, so this is always going to be greater than or equal to epsilon naught, or not epsilon, e, e sub naught. So this is, e sub naught is the lowest level, uh, uh, lowest level energy uh, of your system. And the variational principle says that, you know, given any Hamiltonian and any quantum state, you're always guaranteed to be greater than or equal to uh, e sub naught. So this is a really nice guarantee um, on, your, on your system here. In fact, uh, I think... Let me see if I can find the definition here. Ah, oh, phooey. 
I didn't write it down here, but uh, uh, Michael essentially gives like a one-liner for VQE. And that one-liner essentially it, it encapsulates the variational principle too. So there's this kind of quantum mechanical example, like, okay, so we have um, psi H or this bra, bra psi H and then ket psi is always guaranteed to be greater than or equal to E sub naught. And we take advantage of this in VQE to find a, a usable solution. So this is, this is all well and good. So how do we, how do we go from this how do we go from this to the quantum circuit, right? So how do we go from this to the um, circuit? And this is where Michael, you know, comes to the uh, rescue again, because he also mentions, although his explanation isn't, uh, they always kind of go a little iffy on uh, the explanation. In fact, Michael diverts to another book, which I don't want to shell out 50 bucks for as much as I do love hosting these workshops and, and being able to teach you all. Um, but the basic idea here is there's always going to be some kind of onsots. There's an onsots. What is, what is the onsots? Well, the onsots is a way for us to manipulate the wave function here. So usually it's, it's some, some parameter. Uh, and and it's, it's usually not one parameter, by the way. I'm only putting a singular theta. But you can think of theta as equal to you know, theta 1, theta 2. There are you know, many uh, n thetas, depending on how big of the Hilbert space you want to explore. And then you have your Hamiltonian. And then we have psi theta again. And we're still looking for this E sub naught here. So this onsots is a tunable wave function. That's what I want you to think of it as. It's a tunable wave function. You feed it parameters. And then we, we perform, we can calculate the expectation value. And we can see whether or not we're getting closer or further away from E sub naught. Uh, so basically what happens is there's like your initial state. And then you have uh, your onsots gets applied, onsots. And then you perform, then you perform the uh, measurement to get the uh, expectation value. So that, that's kind of like what VQE is doing here. And the onsots is uh, usually uses a number of parametric gates. So um, it's usually R sub Y theta, or it could be R sub X theta. So it's just a number of these gates that you can tell Qiskit or whatever platform you're using, like, you know, please tweak these, uh, you know, these thetas. So this, this seems good and all. Like, I, I, I'm, I, you know, you start out with maybe cat zero or some known psi, and then we get to psi uh, theta. But the thing that I really want to show you guys is where the heck do you get this expectation value? I guarantee you, if you go online and you dig up some of the existing tutorials, they, they kind of breeze over this expectation value, like how the expectation value is calculated, when in reality, the, being able to calculate that expectation value is kind of the secret sauce. It's the secret sauce to why this algorithm even works in the first place. So I'm going to go ahead and explain it to you guys. So in order to understand, once we get to this expectation part, uh, we need the Hamiltonian. So I'm going to come up with a Hamiltonian. In this case, I'm going to say the Hamiltonian is just um, x plus y. Uh, and these are not variables, right? These are our uh, uh, x gates and y gates, which are based off the uh, poly matrices, or which are usually used for uh, particle spins So you know, you're, uh, in certain directions. So in reality, the Hamiltonian is not defined by the onsots, but it's defined by how you, you perform your measurements. So for let's say I want to find the expectation of this Hamiltonian, right? Uh, so you could say something like this, you know, x plus y. But in reality, uh, there's something called linearity, the linearity of expectation. It's, it's from statistics, but it applies straightforwardly to quantum mechanics, where I, to find the expectation, I can find the expectation of x, then I can find the expectation of y, and then I can find the expectation of any subsequent terms independently. So I don't have to do it in one go. Uh, you chunk up your problem. Uh, there is a diagram that Michael has, and there's another paper, um, uh, not in the original VQE paper, I think, but I have seen it before, where if you, if you are in some like really nice national laboratory or, or I guess some fancy setup, uh, you can do that thing where you define multiple states, and then you apply the onsots to each state, and then you, know, then you can get your, um, your H's out uh, simultaneously, uh, because your measurements will be different to, for each term. So what do, I mean, what do I mean by different for each term? So usually when we are measuring our qubit, right? So let's imagine that uh, I'm starting at ket zero and then I, I have some kind of circuit that's hidden here. And then I perform the measurement, right? This is always like the standard symbol for measurement. Uh, it'll tell me, okay, is it ket zero or ket one? And we usually call this the, uh, the Z basis because zero and one are considered uh, eigen uh, eigenvectors of the Z gate. And there's always like an associated eigenvalue as well. But uh, for our purposes, we only measure it from zero and one. And these are orthogonal to each other. So there's an orthogonal basis based off of 
um, the z gate. So usually when we when we measure a qubit, it's in the z basis, right? So if we want to measure the expectation um, of our state, so this is a if this is psi now because I performed some manipulation. So we are trying to find the expectation of this. So what happens is I'm going to go ahead and measure. I'm going to figure out what psi is. And because we're measuring in the z basis, we don't have to make any changes here. I can just keep the z um, as is. So this is uh, from psi. And this is ket psi. So ket psi will either, in the z basis, it'll either measure out to be 0 or 1. But we're not going to just count up how many times did 0 come up and how many times did 1 come up and sum it up. Because in reality, uh, z has associated eigenvalues. In fact, it's if I apply uh, ket zero to z, um, it's just zero. But if I apply it to one, there's actually this negative eigenvalue that comes up. So, so this is, um, you, you, we're actually keeping track of the, these guys. So this is going to be one, and this is going to be negative one. So z has eigenvalues of one and negative one. And what I am going to do is I am going to repeatedly measure psi. Maybe for, uh, you know how kids can say like a thousand shots, right? So a thousand times, I'm going to measure um, psi in the z basis. I'm going to figure out, OK, so maybe uh, for this particular state, um, I got uh, 300 uh, zeros plus, uh, uh, not, not 200, good lord. I can't even do mental math, uh, plus 700 ket ones. So that means the associated eigenvalues. The, so the associated eigenvalues are what we care about, not the actual um, state here. So this is eigenvalue 1, eigenvalue negative 1. And then from here, we can just do the average um, because we take the number of counts and then your uh, eigenvalues and you sum them over. And that will give you the expectation uh, with respect to the z term. But you'll notice that I defined our Hamiltonian to have an x term, right? So how do we, how do we handle x? Because now, uh, oh, shoot, that's y. OK, no, that's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and retroactively <laughs> correct this. <laughs> uh, my apologies here. This should be z. So, but, but what about this x term, right? So, so now we're no longer in the z basis. Um, I'm, I'm in the x basis, but we still want to figure out what the uh, x is here. Usually what happens is before I perform the measurement, because we can only measure in the z basis with you know, ket 0 and ket 1, I apply uh, some kind of rotation. So I apply a whole rotation. I think it's r y, I want to say of pi or negative pi, uh, or it's, it's a 90 degree rotation though. Um, and, and basically what happens is your basis gets transformed. Um, then you can, you can perform your measurement um, in the z basis, even though we're, we care about the eigenvalues of x. And then from there, you know, within z, we just repeat the same thing and, and we'll get our, um, our expectation value. And the, the overarching idea, because we still want to find the minimum level energy, uh, we want to find the minimum level energy, is we're going to keep finding the expectation value, but then we feed the expectation value to our, our computer. And our computer is running gradient descent or some optimization algorithm, and it will keep track. So it'll, it'll be like, oh, let me, if I tweak theta by some amount, um, what happens? You know, so so if, I, if I apply this theta n um, from the computer, and then it, it'll, uh, the computer realizes like the expectation value increased, which is not what we want. We want the lowest level energy eigenstate or eigenstate and eigenvalue. So then uh, the computer will use gradient descent or some classical optimization algorithm, and it will tune theta such that we will slowly tend towards our, um, our ideal solution. Uh, and and uh, this kind of example uh, is sort of on Michael's website, although the reality is he, I wasn't too satis satisfied with his explanation of the eigenvalues. And um, uh, there's, some, there's another talk by, um, Pranav or, or Gurnav Gokal. I hope I'm getting his name right there, but um, let's see if I can, I can find it here. Shoot. Okay, well, there, there's another talk that also uh, mentions this idea, but the code in that talk uh, explains the, uh, the summing because a lot of times, even uh, IBM Kiskit documentation is guilty of it. They don't tell you that there's kind of this averaging process going on. It just says, okay, find the expectation, do the measurements. And then it's, it's a kind of a black box. It's left up to you to figure out, which I think is um, not in good taste in terms of uh, a pedagogical way of teaching. But I digress. Uh, but yeah, so this is, this is how VQE works. And that's how we can get into QAOA. And this is why, um, so Marv, I hope you have time to do your chunk. I'll try and keep this in, in the next five minutes. But uh, if not, uh, uh, you know, feel free to. So it might run a little longer than usual. So why did I mention you know, VQE um, is sort of related to QAOA? 
Why did I, why did I bother doing this? Well, it's because QAOA is pretty much like VQE, but your onsots is, is constrained or the, the way your onsots is formulated is in a very specific format. And the way we uh, formulate or the derived that onsots is very similar to something you would see in adiabatic quantum computation in that you have your, your two Hamiltonians, H A or H B, or usually uh, in, in uh, AQC, we say it's the initial, H initial, which is some trivial, and then H final. H final is the problem Hamiltonian we want to solve, and we will adiabatically evolve towards that final Hamiltonian. But for QAOA, what actually happens is we'll start in, in some initial state, and then we're going to repeatedly apply two kinds of Hamiltonians. So usually it's um, something that looks like, uh, well, let's see if I can get this right or not. Uh, whoops. So UH. Um, so there's a cost Hamiltonian and then some parameter. I'm going to call it alpha. And then there's a, uh, I know Xanadu calls it the mixer Hamiltonian. Uh, I'm not sure what the, I usually just think of it as the other Hamiltonian. It's the non cost Hamiltonian and then beta, right? So, so what does this U mean? What, I, what actually means is it, it's a, a, a unitary operator. So it's E to the negative I and then A and H. That, that's what I mean here by this notation. And what, what's happening is we're applying these uh, Hamiltonians alternately, right? So you apply this Hamiltonian first, then this Hamiltonian, uh, and you, you'll apply this like kind of back and forth for some amount of, uh, some number of times um, onto your, uh, onto the state in question or your initial state, uh, which I'll just say is, is some kind of psi. Uh, and then you will uh, perform that kind of the, the equivalent expectation measurements I showed earlier uh, and figure out, uh, then you'll tune uh, alpha and beta, because alpha and beta are going to dictate how your operator really looks in a sense. So this, why, why is there kind of this alternating pattern? So, so I should mention that H sub C is the cost Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian that lowest level energy has a solution to our max cut problem, our traveling salesman's problem. And then you have uh, H sub B, which is the, uh, oh, did I say H sub? Uh, yeah, I said H sub B, I don't know why. Uh, this is, uh, Xanadu calls it the mixer. Excuse me, I, I skimmed the original paper. I'm sure they have a name for this, but uh, I, I'm not too certain of it. But basically, we're, we're applying the cost and the mixture Hamiltonians ultimately. And with, with each alternation, we are tuning, um, you're tuning alpha or beta, which is kind of like a, a parameter um, in your, uh, yeah, it, you're, you're just tuning these uh, parameters in the operators. And this is, this is very similar kind of like to our onsots. It's just a specially formulated uh, format of the onsots. And something to note here is why it is that we have a, a cost and a or, or a cost and a mixer is because if we just apply HC over and over, we'll we'll collapse into an eigenstate of the cost Hamiltonian, which is good, right? But it's not the minimum energy eigenstate. It's not guaranteed to be the minimum level energy level. Minimum minimum energy level. I, if one of you guys rewatches this the video and you find that I say like minimum energy level in like 10 different ways, I, I owe you like five bucks or something. But the, uh, the idea here though, is if I just apply HC, that's not enough because I, I'm not guaranteed to get into the lowest level energy. So I apply this mixer, which kind of kicks me out of the, um, it, it kicks you out of the local minima to get to the global minima, which will be our, uh, it's going to be the sort of global uh, energy level that we're interested in. And to add another thing, I mentioned QAOA, QAOA has an associated P with it. There's a P parameter and it said P is greater than or equal to one. And this I mentioned tunes the quality of your solution. The larger P is, the better your solution, but the more resources you have to use as well. And it turns out that P is the number of times you apply HC and HB. So uh, to visually illustrate, let's imagine that this is my quantum circuit. It's got some number of qubits. If P is just one, this is what it looks like. So HC gets applied and then maybe um, HB. I think the ordering might be the other way around here, but this is just, you know, P is equal to one, right? But if P is equal to two, then I have an HC and then HB, and then we go back to, uh, you know, HC again, and then HB. So you see now there are, are sort of two instances on our circuit, but you see the depth of the circuit has increased. I need more, uh, more gates to pull this off. And keep in mind that each of the parameters for each sort of chunk is uh, different uh, in a sense. And uh, you, the, the motivating derivation of like, you know, uh, why we do this kind of alternate application, like okay, you do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, 
comes from the fact that you can think of HCHB is like one big Hamiltonian, but this is actually tricky to uh, come up with precisely, like, like to, to come up with a, a gate example. Uh, so there's something called trotterization that you can do, which basically lets you approximate uh, a Hamiltonian. I'm not gonna put the math there, but you can look it up. Uh, you can trotterize something. Uh, and, and trotterization isn't even a purely quantum mechanical thing. Uh, it has its origins in, in math. When you have matrices, you, you're taking a, a matrix to a certain uh, exponent and the matrices don't commute. So A times B is, is not equal to B times A. In fact, that's another restriction that I should mention is that this mixer Hamiltonian should not commute uh, with H sub C. And in the paper, it's defined as just a bunch of uh, poly X gates. Uh, but that means that your Hamiltonian is, has to be stuck with, uh, it has to be in a non-commuting uh, position or it can't have the X's, I think. So. Uh, yeah, that's, that's essentially the mathematical derivation of QAOA. And, and, and as I keep applying these Hamiltonians, ultimately, I'm also kind of getting the expectation value and, and figuring out what that ideal uh, measurement is. So that, in essence, is the mathematical formulism for QAOA. And I'll go, uh, Samarth, I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing here so you can talk about your, uh, uh, the caveats of the algorithm. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing here. Yeah. Sure, sounds good. Uh, let me just share my screen for that. All right, so uh, so there are a couple of things to keep in mind for the real scalability for this algorithm. Um, the first one uh, is, well, like John had mentioned, when you increase the circuit depth, um, and then you also can increase your number of qubits depending on the problem size you have. You usually get higher quality for a uh, larger um, problem. Uh, so you would, it's in your best interest to increase that circuit depth. But the problem is um, when you increase that circuit depth or you increase the number of qubits, you add in uh, extra noises um, because you are using uh, more frequencies from the uh, arbitrary wave generator that sends in the frequency to the qubits. And then you're also um, using more connections in the, the uh, quantum processor, which while many quantum processors now are being developed with error correcting codes and, and have uh, ways that you can kind of understand what those errors are, they still there's still some level of crosstalk um, that occurs between the, the, um, the qubits. Um, as you probably had seen in the quantum supremacy paper by a route that was still one of the uh, the issues that they were running into and, and one of the things that they saw was that you had this um, crosstalk that exists so for that reason uh, you know if you have a cat you have a little problem in that you know you want the largest uh, number of the largest depth and the largest number of qubits for a large problem to get a good result but then if you increase the the qubits and increase the depth, you also increase the number of errors. So you kind of have to figure out the, um, the threshold by which the, the, you can increase the number of qubits and you can increase the, the depth, but you're not decreasing your, you're not increasing your errors by a crazy amount um, in terms of using these algorithms today. So actually uh, Harrigan and his team at Google had come up with one potential way of, of solving this. Um, and that's basically uh, trying to fit specific subgraphs of your, your original graph, your original problem uh, to the actual hardware. Um, so I don't know if you can see, but in the top right, there's the, on the left-hand side, on the y-axis, you have the, the, um, the ratio, which uh, is the ability for a, a strong QAOA result to be found. And uh, on the x-axis you have the number of qubits and if you can see you have a few different uh, uh, models for this uh, wherein the hardware grid represents a graph that completely follows the grid of that particular hardware implementation um, max cut is the max cut uh, graph that that uh, john had mentioned before um, and sk uh, which stands for sherrington Kilpatrick model and that's another um, uh, graph problem similar Graph set up similar to a max cut, except uh, they are random placements uh, for changes uh, for maximum and minimum cuts. Um, so if you look here, the hardware grid performs better in all cases 
both in the noiseless case, uh, which was the simulation, as well as in the actual experiment. Um, so for, for this reason, it can be seen that if you have a graph that actually uh, confounds to the actual hardware that you were starting with, then you'll do much better. Um, so in terms of how you can like go about that, um, when you have a graph problem that's completely different from your hardware setup, like you have a graph as say the shape of a figure eight, right? But then you have a, a uh, hardware setup that looks like a triangle, right? Like how do you fit a figure eight on a triangle? Um, so one thing that uh, the, the team at uh, Mercedes Benz and uh, actually Dr. Uh, Solano, uh, one of the previous guests of our uh, workshops uh, had worked on before was you can actually add in another Hamiltonian step that can kind of like act as a um, kind of test to see like how the interactions are working with the hardware. So you see in the bottom left, this is like a traditional uh, QIOA setup where you have some sort of a, um, algorithmic piece that's having a resource interaction. Um, and then you have the single qubit operation. Um, and that's similar to kind of what the team at Google was doing before as well. But then you, what they had uh, proposed is you would have this kind of other algorithmic piece that's running maybe in parallel or in another qubit altogether that would just continuously run every time you're running any algorithm. And then that algorithmic piece would then be added to your main algorithmic piece to then get you like, you know, some sort of error corrected uh, answer. So these are definitely two uh, kind of state of the art ways I guess you could go about it is, is yeah, you can either change your algorithm in some form or fashion, or you can change your shape and just change your topology altogether. Um, ideally, you should probably do both. That's probably like uh, the best. And this is actually something that uh, Dr. Solano in his research, in his recent research paper um, uh, with uh, the Q Artist Center in Shanghai had recently done, um, where they had found that uh, if they were to do something similar for like the change in both topology and the change in uh, the Oracle, and they did that for an adiabatic setup, they actually got an improved uh, answer for uh, Shor's algorithm. Um, so this is something that you know can be also implemented for QAOA or on superconducting or other uh, hardware types in the future. Uh, so in terms of like uh, my experience with this and uh, how you can kind of uh, I guess um, cheat using <laughs> you do some sort of cheat code instead of having to use the QPU every single time. Um, so one of the papers that I wrote. Uh, in the last year was with my startup, IF, and we worked with a researcher at the National Academy of Science in Armenia um, uh, named Dr. Pogos, Pogosian. And we basically compared uh, our algorithm that used the uh, QPU um, and an algorithm that used the, the QVM uh, from Rigetti to his uh, classical algorithm that used uh, Gromax um, to then see if uh, our algorithm for finding polarity was something similar to what he was doing for um, uh, finding polarities and temperature control um, on proteins, and if both led to similar results. Uh, and what we found, what we also did interestingly in the study was we compared the uh, max cut Q, uh, QAOA application that we did on the QVM and the QPU to um, the greedy cut and Gomez Williamson's algorithms. Um, so uh, those algorithms actually were tremendously slower than what we saw with QVM and QPU, but still getting us similar polarity values. Um, so we were able to, uh, and then the other interesting thing was the QVM was, was actually faster than the QPU in all cases. Um, so this is probably uh, due to the fact that this was just a three qubit. We were essentially running subgraphs of three qubits across our, um, uh, implementation rather than running our entire protein at once on a quantum computer because that would not be possible today. Uh, and so at that three qubit level, the QVM was actually performing better just because it was running uh, in our actual server. So there was less uh, delay time to access than probably when we were running the QPU, which had to go to the Rigetti server and then come back. Um, so for a lot of early use cases, the QVM is probably going to actually do pretty well. 
Um, and I know like the team at uh, uh, Quantum Computing Inc. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen some of their work before. They have an optimizer that uh, that is used by Los Alamos and by many other labs, and and they they swear by it. Like and, and researchers swear by their simulation software for for these uh, qubits versus using the actual the actual thing where you have noises and you have other issues. Um, so that could that's definitely a, a way to kind of get around those issues today if you want to use quantum algorithms and get that quantum speed up without necessarily having to deal with all the issues of qubits that um, currently exist. But yeah, if, if you want to go with an actual QPU because you need some sort of, you actually want to access that space, that Hilbert space more effectively, then yeah, you probably need to go for, um, you know, something like a uh, topology and a um, algorithmic fit because that seems to be the state of the art in this area. Any questions on that? Have any of you implemented QAOA before? All right. Well, I hope I hope you guys do in the future. Um, any other questions generally for John as well um, about the what we had kind of gone over and. Uh, whatnot. Yeah, uh, I put the video. Um, it, it, it's I got his I got his name wrong. So it was, it's Pranav Gokhal. Um, he did a wonderful job of explaining BQE and that helped me kind of come up with the uh, definition that I gave where I really wanted to drive home the point that uh, oh, hold on, let me, I have my video off. Uh, I really wanted to drive home the point that it takes multiple measurements and you have to get the averages of those measurements and you have to substitute the uh, eigenvector which you measure because we're restricted to measuring uh, state one or state zero, um, then you, but there's an associated eigenvalue that we know ahead of time for individual poly operators. So, um, but his code example does that. 